Good morning, everyone. Hi, John. I'm happy to be up here, and thank you for doing this also. Um, we're going to talk about, or John especially, is going to talk about leadership, compassion and leadership, and such things. Um, and looking out and seeing many of you as entrepreneurs and people who are leaders in your own way, um, hopefully the conversation can speak to what that means to have a wise or compassionate leadership. Um, so let's start with a question, if we can, about the challenges for leaders in the world today. And I think about you being the CEO of some enormous um, enterprise and the kind of relentless demands there are um, and push and pull. You know, how did you become a leader? Um, wh what are the challenges for leaders in this time? Well, first of all, Jack, it's, uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be here and be here on stage um, with you. You know, Jack, I, I, the world's moving so fast, right? And the, the pace of change is accelerating. And uh, we all feel that. And I, 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 the, the demands on leaders and the needs for leadership, I don't think have ever been greater. And I, you know, a really important point, I, I think historically we had a very hierarchical model where the person on top was the leader or there was a group of leaders and then there was everyone else. I think in today's world, everyone is a leader. We're all leaders and we all have to think like that. It, yeah, give yourselves a hand. And you know, as leaders, we, we're, we're faced with a world where we've gotta make decisions really quickly where we have to take action really quickly, often with uncertainty, lack of maybe too much data, but not enough information. And so um, I just think being a leader today is, is both challenging and important. And, and decisions often impact people's lives. You know, the, I think the hardest decisions are those decisions where it feels like you have, there's no good choice. It's the lesser of two evils, or you've got to make a decision for the greater good, but is going to, cause pain or suffering to some subgroup. Um, and so I, I just think leadership is, is both important and, and more needed than ever today, and more challenging than it's ever been in its history. So how did you learn leadership, or how did you become? Well, you know, for me, Jack, leadership's been an intensely personal journey. Mm. You know, when you, when you read about leadership, you know, they're always talking about the external qualities. And, and, and for me, it's, what's been much more important is the internal elements. You know, what I, what I look for in leaders and I look for in myself is, uh, is a leader authentic, right? And, and there's no one style that's right or wrong, but is a leader authentic? Because talented people only wanna follow authentic people. Um, does a leader have this relentless commitment to personal gr learning and personal growth? And I'll tell you, the more, my experience has been, the more senior I've gotten, the more the need to lead, and to learn, rather, has been higher. Uh, does a leader have resilience? That may be the most under-talked about element of leadership, is that, that resilience. And then, does a leader, can they balance self-confidence and self-awareness? And, and, and for self-awareness, you know, for me, I've had to spend time thinking about, all right, who am I? Why am I here? What do I believe in? What are the things that I'm willing to sacrifice for? And, and in my case, over the years, I've learned that I'm a, I'm a purpose-driven person. I, if I can lock into a purpose of an organization, that is what turns me on. I, I believe in servant leadership, that the role of a leader is to serve the customers and serve the employees. Uh, I de believe deeply in people and teams and I'm willing to make bets on people and on teams and stand by those bets. And, and my experience has been that being clear on these things is easy when things are going well, but it's when things are not going well that they're so important. To, it's when you're under the gun, you're in the firing line, you've got to make a decision that you know is going to be unpopular one way or another. 
And staying connected with those things is, is I think, the, the only way to be able to lead through situations like that. So could you give a personal example? <laughs> <laughs> well, I got lots of examples. Because we're all, I mean, yeah, all right, this sounds good. <laughs> How does it play out? <laughs> so when, uh, I'll give an example that's still very alive in my, in my bloodstream. So uh, early on when I, I took responsibility at eBay, the eBay marketplace was unhealthy. It was sick. And so we made a bunch of very big changes. Changes that everyone would have acknowledged were necessary, but changes that no one liked, right? No one likes change. And in this case, the eBay sellers in particular didn't like the changes because it impacted them and their lives. And, and so initially they, they revolted, the, the media picked up on it, our employees, Wall Street, it was kind of a firestorm. And I remember telling myself, okay, stay the course, you're doing the right thing. And then we had an event in, um, in April of 2008 called eBay Live, where this was an event a little like this, where we brought together 15,000 eBay sellers from all over the world for a two-day experience of sharing experiences, sharing learning. And it was in Chicago this particular year, and, and I remember landing in Chicago and, and, and getting a text saying that during the registration, someone had threatened one of our employees, oh. and someone had videoed it and put it up on YouTube, and I better watch it. So I got in the cab, drove to my hotel, went up to my room, flipped open my laptop, and I typed in eBay into YouTube, which is something I'd never done before. <laughs> my, my head of PR told me, never read anything. <laughs> and here's why. The first 10 search results were hate videos about me. Mm. And the first one, I click on the first one, and it's what John Donahoe's doing to eBay, and it's scenes from Schindler's List. And it's the scene where the German guard is shooting the Jewish prisoner, and they transpose my name on the forehead of the German guard, and eBay sellers on the, the chest of the, the Jewish prisoner. Oh. And I'm watching this, and it's had tens of thousands of views, and I'm thinking, oh my God, I, I, it was the most searing moment in my adult life, and I, I just, I just, I couldn't believe it. And I had to, I, I said, is this worth it? Is it worth it? And I sat that night, because I had to give the keynote the next morning, and... We're not gonna do that to you, yeah. by the way, just to kind of reassure you. But what it forced me to do, Jack, was what you teach. I had to sit with the pain eBay sellers were facing. This was their livelihood. And there were some sellers that the pain was extraordinary. And I had to, I had sort of internalized it, but I hadn't really internalized it. And I had to sit with my own pain. I was sort of like in a mode at the time of just trying to fend things off. And over that night, I said, is this worth it? And by sitting with the pain of both, I, by the morning, I was able to say, all right, I, I believe in what we're doing, and we have to do it. And, and that gave me the, some strange courage or energy to be able to stand up the next morning and explain, this is what we're doing and this is why. So it, it was, um, you know, and there are many moments like that. Many of you have had moments like that. It's those cathartic moments that we figure out you know, who we are and what, what it takes to lead. And in a way, it sounds like in doing so, um, outwardly, you perhaps you saved the company, and inwardly, you were called upon to find something that was unshakable in you, to, you know, independent of the circumstances. And that, all of that really speaks to a kind of spiritual dimension of leadership. So it, it makes me wonder how, what personal practice you have or how you've used that to support yourself and, and how we might as leaders. Well, you've had a big role in this. Um, so, you know, I grew up Catholic, and I grew up in a tradition where there was prayer and contemplation, and for the first 30, 35 years of my life, that, that, that served me well. And then I had, it just stopped connecting, and then someone actually gave me a book you had written, and a book Pema Children had written, probably 15 years ago. I was about 45, um, or 40 to 45. I'm 55 now, I'm not good with math. Um, <laughs> Maybe it's a sign I'm older than I think. 
<laughs> um, and I just found that the, the, the whole Buddhist framework resonated for me at that stage of my life. And over the last 10, 15 years, the, the practice has been an important part of, of my life. You know, it was, it was interesting. I, I worked out physically almost every day for 30 years, but I'd never gotten the concept of meditation's the kind of workout of the mind every day, and it's as important. And, and uh, particularly in the times, particularly in the times when things are tough, you know, I, I, I was exposed to Snatham Kaur at that first Wake Up Festival where I first saw you in person. And um, she, this beautiful chanting that just, just cut right through to my heart. And in the tough days at, at eBay, every day I'd listen to her, that, her chant on the driving to work and at night before I'd go to bed. I must have listened to that a thousand times. And it, it, it just reconnected me to who I was as a human, reconnected me with, with why I was there. And then I had the Vipassana retreat experience with Jack at Spirit Rock this fall. Um, and it was, it was transformational. It was a peak experience um, and just taught me even a next level of, of, of depth. And I'm not going to get a chance to do this ever again. So Jack, I want to thank you for the impact you've had on my life. Not just in the... Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I've been lucky in that I've gotten to know you personally over the last year. But for the 14 years behind that, you were just, your words in your books and in your tapes touched me at so many and critical, and it was always the hard times, the times you're just about ready to give up. And, and so I just, I just am deeply appreciative of you um, for that reason. Thank you, thank you. You know, in, in teaching um, and in learning a meditation practice like mindfulness or loving awareness and so forth, one part of what you learn is um, you learn how to regulate yourself, how to find some equanimity and some steadiness, um, how to come back to balance even when you're under fire, as you talk about, or how to have a bigger perspective. You listen to Snatham Singh and you remember, oh yeah, there's a whole galaxy of beauty turning around even though right now it's really pretty painful in the, in the dealings of the company. But beside finding that capacity to regulate, when you quiet the mind and open the heart, what's then available is a channel of intuition in which you can listen to what really matters or what are your vows or what are your values um, that can guide you. And that's different than just regulating yourself. It's coming in touch with some kind of deeper intention. And so you and I talked a little bit about intention and leadership and so forth. And I see that so critical in meditation and spiritual life. It's not just about how you open or regulate yourself, but in even a few moments when you quiet yourself, asking the heart, what's my deepest or truest intention? And you can do that quite directly. So would you talk a little about intention and leadership? You know, I, I, I'm told, how, how many of you are entrepreneurs? I understand a lot of entrepreneurs. Half. So, the other ones they brought, the people they hope will fund them along. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love, we were backstage, I love the woman that said, I just broke up and I just met this guy. <laughs> it was like, there's many, many places uh, and opportunities here. <laughs> but for you entrepreneurs, you're in a world that's magnifying everything that doesn't matter, right? In TechCrunch, you're a hero or you're a zero. You're never in between. We, we magnify the crap out of things when they're going well, and then we pound things when they're not going well. And as a leader, especially an entrepreneur, if you get influenced by that, it's, a, it's like buffeting winds that are impossible to, to deal with. And the reality is you're never half as good as they say you are on your good days and never half as bad as on your bad days. And so the importance of... of Spending that time, as, as you've said and have taught so beautifully, of quieting your mind, of understanding what is my intention? What, what regardless of what the winds are going to do today, regardless of what the winds are going to do in the next month, in the next year, 
What's the course that I want to set for myself? And I, I just think, and by the way, over time, no one remembers the short-term tax. No one remembers what they wrote one day or another or how good or bad. They remember, they remember the journey you've led. They remember the consistency with which you've led your life. You've you led your companies. You've created. And so, and it's hard work. You know, you, you made it sound a minute ago like it's been so easy. It's hard work. It's, and it's still hard. Mm. I'm unemployed and it's still hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, but it takes work. And I think that's the important part. It's the important work that you do. And it's not the work anyone other than people in a setting like this are going to reinforce you with. But it's so important to, at least for me, it's been so important to do that so that in those moments when you are facing those tough choices or in those moments when they're pulling you one way or another, you, 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 you have something to fall back on and to, to have some confidence. I know why I'm here. I know why I'm doing what I'm doing. I have the right intention, even if decisions I'm making are causing pain to others. So there's this combination, you're talking about it, of inner and outer that in some way you need to find a practice or a way that allows you both to quiet yourself and get in touch with your own heart and your, you know, the values that you want to stand for and live by, um, independent of circumstances. Um, but then they have to get expressed. And here you are, you know, you were the CEO of, I don't know how many hundred thousand employees or how many people involved with eBay, eBay huge numbers. How do you then build that same set of values or compassion into an organization? Um, how do you translate that inner intention into an organization? Well, I was blessed um, in that eBay's founder, Pierre Midiar, made one of the core values of the company and of the business. We believe that people are basically good. And Pierre had this philosophy that if, if you treat people strangers anywhere in the world with the spirit of trust and dignity and respect, that will bring the very best out into them. And so he baked that into the eBay marketplace. And then he allowed others to judge the eBay feedback system, right? It wasn't a single authority casting judgment. In fact, the, the job of each person was to trust others and let the wisdom of the crowd then determine if they were behaving in trustworthy ways. And, and he injected that into the company as well. He, he had a, a wonderful um, internal value. And, and for those of you, you, so many entrepreneurs creating your own companies, I, I just share this because I benefited from Pierre's clarity on this. We had a core principle that presume trust inside the company. And you think about something like trust. Usually, you meet someone, you don't know them, so they have to earn my trust, and I have to earn their trust. And the presumption is we need lots of interaction with one another before we can trust each other. And Pierre turned that on its head by saying, presume trust right off the bat. And then over time, if someone loses your trust, they've done that. But, but actually, that happens very, very rarely. And the spirit, the, the, the compassion, that, that comes with that, I think can have a powerful impact on a culture, especially a culture where you've got to make difficult decisions or you have to debate and dialogue and, and wrestle with the hard, the hard work of business or the hard work of life. And, and so I do think it's possible to build it into the culture. And I think founders, and it, it sounds like we have a lot of founders and entrepreneurs in the, in the audience today, you, you can bring that into your companies. I, I was blessed with a founder that that brought that into, into eBay. So whether it's trust or whether it's building in compassion as a value or as I've learned, if you want to have diversity in your company yeah. or your world, you don't do it as an add-on. You start with a diverse team, you know? And you start by start, the ground that you begin with is already the setting, the outer setting of your intention. It's, this is what I'm understanding from you and, and, and I understand it. Um, I guess the other thing, it says please wrap up, so we'll wrap up, you know, at some point. Um, <laughs> this is Jack Cornfield. <laughs> yeah, is um, I've, one of the great pleasures that I've had in my life is mentoring people, is um, 
seeing the good, you talked about it, seeing the Buddha nature or the potential in someone, even if they're still pretty green, and by seeing that and appreciating it and believing in it, it fosters that, whether it's a spiritual development or a leadership development. So la the last question then, how do you, you know, how is it for you? You've been a mentor, I'm sure, to lots of people. And anything you want to say about that? Well, you know, Jack, the thing I would say is I never think about, I, I think about my mentors, and, and I've never, I have a lot of them. Mm -hmm. I've never had someone when I've said, can I buy you a cup of coffee and pick your brain? Say no. And as we were just talking backstage, that's exactly what I'm doing now in this period of, of discernment and reflection in my life. I'm going to wise people, many of whom I don't know, and saying, I'd love for you to share your story. I'd love to pick your brain about issues I'm grappling with. Um, and I encourage all of you, if you have a chance to do it. I rarely will people say no. And then when people ask the same of me, all I can do is be present and listen and share experiences, share stories. And, and through that, I think community builds. And are you in retirement? Um, how are you doing so far? It's just <laughs> months, I realize it, you know. How does it's been, it feel? It's been wonderful. It's been, um, I haven't had this kind of break or time off in 30 years. Um, I'm trying to, I still feel young, even though I can't figure out how old I am. Um, and, you know, I feel like it's, all right, on the notion of servant leadership, how can I best serve in the next stage of my life? And, and um, I'm in this wonderful phase right now where I'm, I'm just having many others, including you, share their stories and, and then just seeing what, what resonates, what speaks to me. And, you know, as you've told me, trust. I'll figure it out. I'm sure you will. Thank you all for your kind attention. It's a pleasure.